Hello friends, and welcome to the first Sunday of Advent and the beginning of a new series from the General Commission on Religion and Race of the United Methodist Church. This series is entitled Reimagine Advent, Discover the Liberating Christ. As we light a new candle on the Advent wreath each week, we will be hearing or singing I hope you'll sing along with a song by my colleague Dan Damon called Hope is a Light. Hope is a light. Hope is a light to show the way. Light the candle of hope As our Christ reminds us there will be signs. We perceive them in the rumbles of overfracked earth, in the shadows upon plastic-filled seas, and in the carbon emissions slowly choking our skies. As our Christ reminds us, there will be signs. We hear them in the voices that cry out Black Lives Matter and Stop Asian Hate. We see them on the bodies scarred by policing policies born out of slavery and white supremacy. As our Christ reminds us, there will be signs. Can we see them in the coming of God? Will we answer their call and become partners in God's work of healing and redemption? O Christ, hear our prayer. Luke 21, 25-36 There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth there will be dismay among nations in their confusion over the roaring of the sea and surging waves. The planets and other heavenly bodies will be shaken, causing people to faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world. Then they will see the human one coming on a cloud with power and great splendor, now, when these things begin to happen, stand up straight and raise your heads, because your redemption is near. Jesus told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, you know that God's kingdom is near. I assure you that this generation will not pass away until everything has happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will certainly not pass away. Take care that your hearts are not dulled by drinking parties, drunkenness, 
and the anxieties of day-to-day -day life. Do not let that day fall upon you unexpectedly, like a trap. It will come upon everyone who lives on the face of the whole earth. Stay alert at all times, praying that you are strong enough to escape everything that is about to happen and to stand before the human one. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord, for you are our strength and our salvation. Amen. I have partially abandoned preaching from the lectionary in recent years, choosing instead to preach in series, drawing inspiration from books or current events to craft a theme that I spend a few weeks addressing and finding scriptures that are appropriate to that theme. I have also taken cues from other scholars and preachers who have curated series ideas. Two compelling reasons for preaching in series are that one can reach a wider swath of the congregation, since not everyone attends every Sunday, and that one can delve more deeply into a topic. Sometimes I create or draw from a series that is actually crafted around the lectionary texts, as is the case with our approach to Advent this year. And for those who may be unfamiliar with the term, the lectionary is a Bible reading schedule of sorts, developed in a collaborative effort among scholars from various Christian denominations, assigning a portion of the Old Testament, the Psalms, a New Testament letter, and the Gospels to each Sunday of the church year. The lectionary covers three years, called years A, B, and C, focusing primarily on the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, respectively. Not counting the Psalms, about 14% of the Old Testament is covered in those three years, and 72% of the New Testament, that is if all four texts are read each week. Some churches that follow the lectionary still do read all four texts each Sunday, while many preachers just choose one or two. Now you might guess, and guess correctly, that because today's scripture text comes from Luke, that we are in year C. Today, the first Sunday of Advent, also happens to be the first day of the church year. I will not be giving a quiz at the conclusion of this sermon. I am wondering, however, whether many of you are familiar with the passage that Albert read for us from the Gospel of Luke, because I think that the last time I preached on this text was 12 years ago, and I wasn't even in Windsor then. These are among the darkest words spoken by Jesus, and they are reserved by that consultation group on the lectionary for the first Sunday of Advent. Jesus speaks similarly dark words in Matthew and Mark, by the way, also designated for Advent 1 in years A and B. They are all recorded as words from Holy Week, warnings that Jesus spoke to his closest disciples after their arrival in Jerusalem, as he anticipated his arrest, trial, and death. The lectionary scholars chose Advent, I believe, rather than Holy Week, as the time to read these passages in church because they thought it appropriate to start the church year with a view to the end of the story, to mark the annual congregational journey through the stories of Jesus' life on earth with a time of looking forward to Jesus' return. Jesus' return is not a topic that is regularly broached by white mainline Protestant clergy. We are, well, I'll admit it, I am, simply too uncomfortable with scaring people, not finding that to be a helpful motivation in matters of faith. I read Jonathan Edwards' famous 1741 Great Awakening sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, back in college, as well as a number of tracts handed to me by well-meaning street evangelists when I was a teenager and visions of judgment, fire, and brimstone steered me away from anything resembling that tactic for years. 
but here I am in 2021, reading this text with fresh eyes, reflecting on the Black Lives Matter movement, climate change, and the increasing awareness that genocide and exploitation is not just something that happens in remote parts of the world, but has long been a strategy of power holders and policymakers in our own land, a land that was stolen and colonized in brutal fashion over and over, generation after generation. The names and the methods change, but the impact of the trauma just continues to pile up. Jesus was born into and lived out his earthly life as the subject of a colonizing power. His people's land had been taken over many times through the centuries, its resources exploited and its people taxed heavily and subjected to fear and intimidation. Into this context, Jesus came, not as a member of an educated or elite class, but as a commoner, a peasant, a laborer. He was born into state-orchestrated homelessness, spent his early childhood as a refugee, and grew to adulthood in an obscure backwater town far from the centers of power. He was arrested, tortured, and killed by the occupiers at the behest of the paranoid ones who held tenuously onto an uneasy position of accommodation. If there's anyone with whom Jesus should readily identify, it is with those on the margins, the oppressed, the hungry, the migrant, those whom the government has tried to exterminate, like him. And if we dare to follow this Jesus, we must throw our lot in with those whom he loves. And we must wake up and stay alert. We must listen to the roaring of the seas and of the toiling and tired masses. We must pay attention to the trees and the seasons and the times. We must take care not to dull our senses with self-soothing. Our Wednesday Zoom group has been talking on Zoom and via follow-up email conversations over the past couple of weeks about land acknowledgments and related issues. This might not be a familiar term to you. It refers to a long-held indigenous practice which has recently become quite popular in many settings, from academia to sports, entertainment, and other public events. A land acknowledgement often is given at the beginning of an event and is a statement recognizing that said event is taking place on land which once belonged to a particular native people. So we could, for example, open worship with a solemn acknowledgement that the land on which our church building sits was once the territory of the Southern Pomo. What some of us have been learning is that many land acknowledgements are not done well and even do more harm than good. They do not consult with or start from a relationship with the peoples thus acknowledged. They sweep under the rug violent history and trauma done to those people. They contribute to the erasure of Native peoples, relegating them to the past. And they do nothing to chart a path forward toward restoration of stolen lands or redress of the many harms done. Done poorly, such acknowledgments are trite measures meant only to soothe the consciences of white folks. Done well, such acts of corporate confession might educate and help give visibility to those long relegated to the margins and be a first step among many toward building relationships, solidarity, and taking concrete actions for justice. It may seem odd that this biblical text, 
with its ominous words of warning, is assigned to the week of Advent which focuses on hope. Perhaps, though, we have poorly defined the word hope, falsely equating it with wishful thinking or with good feelings. Perhaps Christian hope is something deeper. In the last chapter of The Field Guide to Climate Anxiety, a book that our Wednesday group read together last month, I was drawn to a quote attributed to the former Czech Republic president and playwright Václav Havel. Hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. I have been turning that sentiment around in my head this week in preparation for Advent. Hope. Hope without truth is an empty sham. Opening ourselves to truth, however painful it might be, is a pathway that can lead to hope. So stay alert. Stay rooted. Be steadfast in your dedication to uncovering falsehood and to hearing the truth of others' stories. Bring to light the actions and the systems that have stolen other people's hope. And look for partners to help make sense of things and bring transformation to this broken and hurting world of ours, one connection at a time. Fasten your seatbelts, brothers and sisters. It's Advent now. Amen. Now be people of hope. Let hope live in your heart and share the hope of Christ with all you meet. 
Share hope by noticing someone else's humanity. Share hope by listening to someone's story. Share hope by praying for our world. In this Advent season, we need to see, feel, and share hope. As you go out into the wonder of God's creations, share hope with those you meet. Amen.